everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for coming to the summit. Um, we feel really blessed to have so many amazing people in the same space, and thanks for that. Um, so as Ben said, my personal experience um, around this issue is um, volunteering, running projects in Greece on the island of Samos, which is um, a very small island just um, very near to Turkey, and it's one of the first arrival points where people arrive to Europe when they're seeking refuge. Um, having spent a lot of time there, um, I have noticed that um, we're working very closely alongside um, the official actors, so that would be the government agencies and the big INGOs, obviously with very different capacity and resources. Uh, we're mostly volunteers or we're individuals who, if we're paid, we're, we're working on very scant budgets. Um, and our way of working is very different, it's very responsive, we're often much more embedded in communities and in some ways closer to, to maybe arguably to what's actually happening. Um, and there is this disconnect which I've observed, and um, many, many people feel that it's there. And I think particularly at the moment in the Greek islands, the situation is really bad. Um, there are a lot of people being contained in very small islands in um, camps which were built as reception and information centres which have become detention centres. Essentially the islands have become prisons. Um, and it's a real hotbed of emotion, there's a lot of violence, there's um, a lot of human rights um, issues coming up, you know, the, the situation that people are living in is terrible. Um, and I sort of feel personally that that isn't necessarily being addressed by certain agencies and a lot of the work on the ground is being carried out by grassroots organisations who, as I said, are under-resourced and perhaps unsupported at times by those larger organisations or not recognised for their contribution. Um, and so that's what this discussion is about. It's about trying to have that conversation in an open space um, and hopefully we can all kind of give different perspectives and you guys will be able to do that as well. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear from four speakers, and for your information, but also for the speakers, particularly those on Skype, be around seven minutes for them each to um, to speak, and then, as I say, there'll be a, a plenty of opportunity for questions and answers. So I'd like to introduce the first speaker, who is on Skype, who is Dr. Manos Lodothetis, who some of you will be aware of is a, a medical doctor himself, and has been responsible for saving hundreds of lives, working with hundreds of refugees, thousands of refugees who've arrived on Greek islands. He's now um, the migration ministry in the new uh, Greek government, the new Greek uh, administration. And he's joining us online, we hope. Yeah, he's just is he there? Through, uh, not just yet. Okay. Uh, he was, he was there. He was, he's, he's also uh, at an event himself. So he's gonna, uh, hello. Hello. Hey, Fantastic. doctor. Hi. Hi, how are you? It's been a while. Yeah, it's been. Who is it? Sorry, it's you. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Okay, if we've you got a room full of people okay. here. Okay. Dr. Manos, I was just explaining, we've got about seven or eight minutes each for the speakers, so we'd love to hear your perspective, please. There's a room full of people here looking forward to hearing from you. Perfect. So, what am I supposed to to tell what is the perspective of how we are going to do things from now on, something we, like we're, that. We're very interested in, in the perspective from the Greek administration on the situation as it is and the plans, but also the, what we're looking at in this session in particular is the relationship between the work of the, the government, the international NGOs, but the huge amount of humanitarian responders that are responding to the crisis as well. Okay. Let's start from the general uh, perspective and then we will move on to the NGO and uh, international organization and volunteers, okay? So, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah perfect. So, what we took over is like uh, a situation of uh, accommodation crisis, let's say. And uh, we found out that we have this accommodation crisis because we have a crisis in asylum. So our main objective is, of course, to build, let's say, the accommodation scheme that will be able to host all the people that are arriving on the islands and uh, in the mainland of Greece. But at the time, main time, we will try strongly to uh, make a better, let's say, procedure and to have a faster procedure and more efficient asylum-wise. 
Why? Because the main objective of the reception and accommodation system is to host and serve asylum seekers. What is happening in Greece is that we have asylum seekers that do not get an answer uh, for four years. And this leads to an overwhelming uh, pressure in the accommodation scheme. The accommodation scheme of Greece now, the reception scheme, is uh, with a capacity of around 65,000 people. And it's actually serving around 80,000 people. The biggest pressure is on the islands, of course. Why? Because the accommodation scheme there is supposed to host something like 7,000 people in all islands, and it's hosting something around 40,000 people in all islands. So this means, if you take the numbers down, that we have still some place left in the mainland, and we will try to move people from the islands to the mainland pretty soon. The rest is that we have to improve, actually enlarge, the, the capacity of the system on the islands. And at the same time, to create a um, procedure in asylum that will be fast. When we mean fast, we mean European fast, which is around six months to a year. So if you want to have a system on the islands for hosting asylum seekers for six months, you need a system of around 25,000 people. There is a rollover, as you can understand, but the capacity should be around 25,000. And this is why we announced that we are going to build new reception identification centers of a bigger capacity. In Greek terminology, we call them closed. Why? Because this is what the Greeks will hear easier. Uh, the thing is that we will follow the law. The Greek law, not the new one, but the old one as well, said and says that when you arrive in Greece, you are supposed to be in a closed center up to 25 days for uh, the reasons of registration. After that, you are allowed to go to an accommodation center, which should give you the opportunity to get out in, in a time frame that will last from 8 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock in the night or 10 o'clock in the night. It will have some regulations for safety reasons because they are going to be huge camps and you know that, for example, in many of these camps we have a, a lot of criminality going on during the night and not during the day. So we have to take these, some measures on that just to protect the people so we will split them in, let, let's say, neighborhoods or sections, but sections that not sound nice, but in, in areas that they will be protected during the night. So this is what we are trying to do. Of course, we will have some part of the new camps that will be the so-called in Greek prokeka, which, which are the pre-return centers, okay? Because we need to have a capacity to host people that their asylum request was rejected and they are supposed to be uh, returning uh, back to their own country or to Turkey. This is what we are talking about and this is what we are trying to do. Uh, we have a new law that will make the procedures a little bit faster. Why? I'm, I'm saying that, that for the time, because we believe that the best uh, for, the, um, for them, I mean for the people, is to get a response from the system as quick as possible. It should not be that difficult to give a, a response to an asylum seeker that should uh, last forever. Nowadays, as I told you, it lasts for three to four years, just to get the, the response in the first degree, which is unacceptable. In Europe, the mean time is around six months for 50% and six months and one year for the rest. So 50% of the asylum seekers in Europe get a response on the first six months of their stay in the country. When they get a response, as you can understand, they are either a refugee or an immigrant. If you are a refugee, you get your papers and you are allowed to integrate into Greece uh, for the next three years. If you are not a refugee, then you are an immigrant and you have two options. One option is that you voluntarily return to your country or you remain here illegally. 
This means that maybe the Greek police will arrest you and put you in jail and try to make you go back to your country. And this is a, a game that will continue until you voluntarily most probably say that I want to return to my country because I cannot anymore stay in this spiral life of every once in a while go into prison for 90 days then get out and then go back to prison and that. What we are missing in Europe, not only in Greece, is a common return policy that will give them a better perspective in returning back to their country. We have the voluntary returns, but they are strongly manipulated from other nationalities. So from Greece, we return people to Georgia with AVRA. From Holland, they return people to Albania through AVRA. You can understand that this is a manipulation of a benefit, yes? So we should think on all these aspects and try to make a policy in Europe that will be efficient mostly for the people who are asking something to us. This is what, this is the perspective that we have now. And the last thing I have to tell you is that we, you will hear and a lot of the humanitarian organization um, tell that this law is really strict and uh, the, how the government is moving and stuff. We are facing a big difficulty. The difficulty is that we are supposed to do two things. First, be the gatekeeper of Europe. Secondly, accommodate and be humane to a big amount of people that come to Greece. I visited a lot of European countries in the last few months, and I noticed that there is a huge difference in between what they do in Europe and what we do in Greece. What is this difference? In Europe, because the final destination of all the people, most of the people that cross Greece, is to find themselves in northern Europe, they follow their capacity. So if you have a registration center in, I don't know, uh, Holland, this registration center has a capacity of 2,000. They will never exceed this capacity. Why? Because they, they can do that. How? When someone appears on the door of a registration center in Europe, and the registration center is full, they tell him, come back in 10 days. In Greece, we cannot do that, because if we do that, we are back in 2015. Because no one would like to stay 10 days in Samos to be registered. They will start moving to other areas of Greece, and then most probably to other areas of Europe. So we are supposed to keep them there and register all of them there. This is really hard. Why? Because the camps, as you know, you visited most of them, do not have a capacity that can be like an accordion that can be extended from 2,000 to 10,000 and then to 20,000 and then maybe back to 2,000. It is not that easy. The first step for us is to build at least a camp for registration that has a sufficient capacity according to what we think that the new system will actually succeed on. So this is what we strongly uh, implement at the moment. Concerning the relationship with the international organizations, NGOs, and of course volunteers. Uh, Sally knows Dr. me Manos. for a long time now. Dr. Manos, and, if I could just ask uh, you to share your thoughts on that very briefly in a minute or so, just to our time, that would be much appreciated. Yes. So, just one minute, eh? Yeah. How much time? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, we strongly believe that we are an independent state. We are supposed to be, the, let's say, the leader in this whole uh, effort. But we would love to cooperate with everyone under certain circumstances. As I told you, Sally knows me for a long time now, I was the first one who asked all the volunteers to register themselves. The day I did that, back in Malagari port in Samos, three of the volunteers left with the next plane. So there is a safety issue there. If you want to be there, you should at least register. So we know who you are, you have a card given to you by the Greek state that you are an official volunteer and you can actually 
do what you want to do. But if you choose not to register, then there is a lot of danger for the beneficiaries, mostly. I'm not afraid from myself only. You can understand that. We had incidents of pedophiles and other people who showed up as volunteers, said that they want to help, but their main objective was different. That is why when we told them that you have to register, they left. From then on, many things have changed. Of course, we have a problem with a non-homogeneous approach to the NGO world from camp managers. This is a main issue in Samos, where I was. That is my effort now. We try to make a homogeneous system of registration of all NGOs with a common template <coughs> and volunteers. They all get just one card, one, I don't know, an MOU uh, contract. I don't know what else we can sign, which has some... Uh, you know, uh, standards that we all follow, uh, code of conduct maybe, some things that we will all agree upon, and then we know what is the framework of our everyday life in a camp of Greece. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manos, for your inputs. I hope you can Thank you. <coughs> stay with us to hear some, some thoughts. Of course I will stay. Thank you. So we're now going to stay on the line, uh, yes. if that's okay, so I'll and we're going to hope to speak to Erasmia Rumana, who's a senior protection officer for the UNHCR in Greece. And we'll just get Erasmia on the line now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. She was there. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Can you hear us okay? Hello? Can you hear me? Very low, very low. Okay. 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 Can you just try your sound again? Very quiet. I think what we might do, if it's okay with the, um, the next speaker, is we'll move on to the next speaker whilst we just, okay. can you just try to sort yeah. the sound out? Yeah. Uh, thank you. So our next speaker is um, Hilary Margolis. Um, my name is Ben Margolis, and I've never been on a panel with another Margolis before. And we're not related, so we're desperately trying to work out our shared Ashkenazi Jewish um, <laughs> heritage outside. Um, Hilary is the, uh, a senior researcher on Europe and Central Asia for Human Rights Watch and I believe has quite recently returned from Greece uh, and will share some of the perspectives from herself and from Human Rights Watch. Thank you. Um, I, I will try not to use my whole seven minutes because I think uh, we really want to hear from all of you. Um, I, I focus on women's rights specifically, so I have been in Greece multiple times with emphasis on looking at the situation for women and girls asylum seekers and refugees, in, uh, both in, on the islands and in northern Greece. Um, just to talk a little bit about our role and what we do, um, for those who may not be familiar with our work, and tell me if you can't hear me, by the way. Um, we are not a service providing organization, so we do documentation of human rights abuses and human rights issues and then use that information to conduct advocacy uh, with the goal, obviously, of improving conditions, uh, stopping human rights abuses, and, and so forth. And we do that at multiple levels. So we work with local communities and, and local government all the way up to international agencies, um, whether it's the UN, um, you know, international bodies, EU bodies, and so on, uh, as well as national governments. And so our role is really not the same as some of, as a lot of, I think, what a lot of you do, which is really providing on the ground assistance um, and, and at a very local level. Um, I, I would say that in some ways, often we act as sort of a, a conduit, I think, between very local community organizations and sort of 
national or international bodies. So we work very closely with community groups to gather information and to document what's happening. Uh, and then to bring that information to uh, policy makers, decision makers, and so on. And I think, you know, one of the ways we see ourselves is as being there to say things that sometimes other people cannot say, um, particularly groups that are working on the ground and have issues around, um, you know, relationships with the government, relationships with other actors, um, potential security risks, and so on, um, but also to bring it to different fora and to really amplify the voices of people on the ground. Um, so that's kind of the goal, and, and so often we're, in a way, can be sort of a go-between where we might be able to bring issues in a way to higher level organizations um, where it might be risky for someone who's really working day to day on the ground to do so. Um, in terms of, of the situation that, that we're talking about here in Greece in particular, um, and I just want to note that I think, you know, it isn't only Greece, obviously. I mean, I think Greece is one of the more extreme situations right now in Europe, but we've seen very similar issues in Italy, um, in France, uh, but particularly Italy and Greece. Um, I was in Lesbos most recently in the fall, in October, November, and um, I mean, yeah, what what Dr. Mano says is exactly right. It's you know very much over capacity. The conditions are extremely dire, um, and it really is a situation that's inhumane uh, and that's putting a lot of people at risk. And I think, in terms of sort of the role that different groups are playing, um, a lot of the actual day-to-day -day management and day-to-day -day services are being provided by very local groups, by NGOs, both international and local or independent. Um, but that is really where a lot of the sort of burden of providing direct services is falling. Uh, and when I was there most recently, the situation was extremely grave. I mean, at the time, I think there were close to 17,000 people in Moria, which has a capacity for less than um, 6,000. So now it's close to 19,000 people. Um, and one of the things that the local service providers were telling me, and this was particularly regarding issues for women, so violence against women, um, health care, uh, maternal health care, and health care for pregnant women, and, and so on was that they're being forced to make impossible choices because they simply cannot keep up with the demand uh, because of the overcrowding, because of the lack of additional support for services in the camp and outside the camp. Uh, and so the strain that this is putting on the refugees and asylum seekers themselves, but also on the actual service providers is very evident. Um, and I think you know, one of the questions in this context is how do the Greek government and the large NGOs or large agencies and the smaller agencies work together to come to a sort of arrangement that will take some of that, relieve some of that, that burden on everyone and make um, the services more available and provide better conditions for everyone. Um, and of course, you know, one of the things we're always advocating for very strongly is for other countries in Europe to also accept more asylum seekers and refugees, because of course that is a big um, bottleneck. Um, but also for, uh, you know, the Greek government to do things like, you know, was just said, certainly to create speedy asylum procedures, but ones that absolutely adhere to international law and respect the needs and um, really identify the needs of anyone applying for asylum or refugee status. And that's one of the concerns is just making sure, because one of the things that we've seen over and over again is that a lot of the people we meet in these, in these camps and in these displacement situations have not had their needs identified. And so 
they might be eligible for some kind of benefit or some kind of faster process, but that has never been determined. Uh, and so we find people who, you know, they might be victims of, of sexual violence, they might be unaccompanied children, they might be, um, you know, single mothers with young children, but they're not being identified as such, and therefore they're put into a very precarious situation. And one of the concerns about faster processing, of course, is having that overlooked. Um, so certainly we would welcome faster processing and safer conditions in adherence with any kind of international standards. Right. Thank you very much, Henry. Final on seven minutes. Have we had any luck? Yeah, Rasmia, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear very well. You? Okay, fantastic. Yes. Okay, so we're going to go back on the line now to, as I said, Rasmia Rahani is the Senior Protection Officer for the UNHCR in Greece. And Erasmus, we've got a um, limited amount of time, but it'd be good to hear your thoughts on the situation and, and perhaps in particular on your uh, response to the changes that the Greek government is, is proposing at the minute. Yeah, um, I, as you know, UNHCR, as UNHCR uh, and thank you for, very much, first of all, for the invitation. Um, as you need here in Greece, uh, we have been here also before the emergency. We were focusing more on advocacy and monitoring, but since 2015-2016, uh, uh, we, provide we provided exceptionally support uh, to Greece to deal with this situation. Um, uh, sin uh, since 2017, uh, we have started uh, reducing our activities, but we still continue to cover a range of uh, different thematic areas that I will tell you about. Um, the situation now is uh, the management of, um, of the refugee and migrant uh, flows in Greece. It is uh, uh, managed by the Greek authorities. You know that there has been uh, lately, recently, uh, the Ministry of Migration and Asylum re-established. Um, we cooperate with them, we provide the support to respond. But uh, as also you can see, there are a lot of announcements and plans by the Greek government to uh, be able to handle this situation, especially with uh, the new law that uh, started uh, its application uh, as of January 2020. And we already see uh, changes uh, in, the, um, uh, in the reception identification centers on the islands, uh, where the EU Turkey statement still uh, is uh, applied and valid. Uh, as observation, you, you, we first see that um, accelerated procedures, uh, some uh, uh, changes in the vulnerability, um, and I mean, the inclusion, the, the, the role of the vulnerability in the procedures has changed. Before, uh, people, vulnerable persons were exempted from the border asylum procedures, but now they are not. Um, so the vulnerability plays more of a role in the reception uh, uh, um, uh, conditions, whether there are reception conditions there or not, and not uh, a role in the asylum procedures. We also uh, see here, because still we haven't seen, uh, observed any uh, big uh, uh, change in this, that uh, there are a lot of uh, commitments and announcements for more returns. Uh, so this is something that uh, we are all uh, waiting to see how it will uh, evolve. In the meantime, I will agree also uh, with the previous speaker, people remain there with a geographical restriction, the majority of them, although, as you may know, there, there are more than 5,000 people that they have no geographical restriction, uh, but uh, for them it is not possible to move to the mainland due to the limitations in the accommodation capacities. So uh, the, the situation, the overcrowding, the dire conditions, uh, especially for persons with specific needs, uh, you know, a, a big percent, more than 30% of the population in their rigs of the five rigs on the islands, they are children. Uh, the nationalities from, you know, refugee uh, profiles. The Siri. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you really well now. Yeah. Hello? Syrian, Hello? Afghans, um, but also from uh, uh, DRC, Somalia, Eritrea, there are multiple nationals. Uh, Palestine, of course. And uh, the, all this, the five centers operate beyond their capacity. Uh, on the top of this, I would put Samos uh, as the situation there is uh, very, uh, the conditions are very substandard. Most people 
uh, live in uh, makeshift shelters outside uh, the Rig. I was also there uh, uh, just a few days ago. The weather conditions make the situation even more difficult. And uh, I don't want to, to talk more about it uh, because I think that everybody knows about this situation. It's very well presented also in media and uh, different reports. Now, um, from our side, as I said, our role here is to provide some complementary support. Uh, you know, we run the STI, uh, we still have the STI accommodation and we are working with the government for its transition to the authorities. It, uh, it's about, um, it's uh, for 25,000 uh, 25, places and more in apartments for the most vulnerable asylum seekers. The majority, of course, of these places are in the mainland. And then the, another uh, very significant contribution is the cash assistance, which also plays is very significant the impact uh, on the islands. We see the people they use this um, cash assistance also for their to cover b very basic needs, even food and uh, medicine. And we continue our advocacy and the monitoring, which is a core protection role of UNHCR. And for the winter. Since there was no winterization, as you all uh, have witnessed as well, um, most people have plastic uh, in order to cover their tents and makeshift shelter in uh, Samos or Moria. Um, we provided uh, some extra amounts for uh, um, uh, winter purposes so that people could buy something more for the winter. I know that all this may sound um, uh, less. They make a difference, though. And I think that uh, there is complementarity also from all the other actors, from NGOs and uh, volunteers, because there are a lot of volunteers working uh, on Samos, on Lesbos, and uh, our advocacy is also uh, to to call for the authorities and uh, these entities to coordinate uh, actions in order to to have more targeted assistance to people. Uh, it's very, we acknowledge all these efforts and we believe that uh, wherever there is better solid coordination with NGOs and volunteers, we see that also the situation may be uh, a bit more improved. Like we see differences between Samos, for example, and, and Lesbos, where uh, on Lesbos there is a, a better network of coordination. Um, for the local communities, also I would like to mention that also when we had uh, missions from Geneva coming, they all, it is striking uh, about uh, how in some locations, the local communities, despite the protests or the, the complaints, uh, they are also quite tolerant uh, towards this situation in their small uh, communities. Um, yes, there are incidents that could be, uh, have a, a xenophobic connotation here and there, but the majority of people, I think, they are protesting against uh, uh, central authorities for the management of the situation rather than the refugees themselves. Um, yes, our teams are present in the rigs, and we, we will uh, continue to, with our limited uh, uh, capacities, of course, uh, to continue on SGBV child protection issues, along with other actors also engaged in uh, these areas in support of the authorities. And uh, yeah, I don't want to take more of your time. If you have any questions afterwards, I could uh, go into more details. Thank you very much, Eras. We have a spot on time. Uh, and there will be a chance for questions in a moment. I'm just going to invite one more speaker um, to share her experiences now. And that's Sarah, who's sat next to me, Sarah Rijak, who is a grassroots humanitarian responder who's based on Samos and has set up a project called Still I Rise, including a youth centre on Samos and is going to share a couple of her experiences with us. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Sarah and the organization I run provides education for refugee minors aged 12 to 17. Right now we have about 140 students who come to our center six days a week. Of those students, about 50 to 60 of them are unaccompanied minors. Although our initial mission was specifically to fill the gap in education for these students, it did become very quickly apparent that they needed further supports related to social work and healthcare, particularly the unaccompanied minors. Um, 
we were able, we just started receiving their concerns and they would show us pictures of their accommodation, pictures of what was going on in the camp. We are not working within the camp. Um, on the island of Samos, it's, each camp is different, but it's very restricted of who is able to enter the camp. So um, as we received all of this information from our students directly, we started compiling it and um, we were able to submit two different um, authorities the evidence that we have seen of human rights violations against unaccompanied minors. Um, the most recent one was in December, we were able to support five unaccompanied minors, specifically relating to their accommodation inside of the RIC or in the extended area. On Samos, there is a very large, basically a field that many of these unaccompanied minors end up living in for significant amounts of time. Um, so we were able to submit it to the um, United, um, sorry, the High, uh, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on it. High Court of European, European Rights, Human Rights. Rights. European yeah. right, Human Rights. Um, and we were able to submit all this documentation and for the five minors they were able to receive um, expedited movement off of the accommodation within the Samos RIC for their safety and protection, um, which was a good successful thing. However, it also still highlights all of the other unaccompanied minors on the island and the supports that they need. Um, our organization has been able to work with many of the other organizations and also occasionally with the camp management, but it is a back and forth. It can be very, very difficult to um, come to agreements um, and to have movement forward when one thing is what should be provided within the camp and another thing is what we see every day on the ground, what we see in the images of the, the safe space that should be available to unaccompanied minors. Um, a recent situation that does show that cooperation can produce good results is we have seen within our center a very large outbreak of skin infections, including scabies, among the unaccompanied minors. And we were able to reach out to um, not specifically the camp doctor, but their assistant who is tasked with um, looking for infectious diseases. And by working with this person through emails, we know personally the students who have been affected and have been able to compile a list and try to get them the better support within the camp. What's so difficult with medical care for unaccompanied minors is they need permission from their assigned guardian. And if there's a gap between the NGOs and communicating with the public prosecutor or the un assigned guardian for the unaccompanied minors and then communicating with the camp who should be providing health care. Those, those things need to be bridged. In this case, it's been slow going, but it seems that it is possible to collect the information, reach out to the people who should be able to provide better support <coughs> to reduce spreads of disease within um, refugee camps and environments like this. Um, it is possible and we're we're in the process of really supporting these students to get better um, healing for their, their bodies and, and hopefully safety in the camp as well. Um, so much that happens in Samos is really unique to Samos. Every refugee camp, I've heard stories from Lesbos and from other camps, different relationships between the camp management and the NGOs, the coordination between those groups and who attends those meetings, who is invited or not invited, is really difficult and it does depend on who's leading those organizations each day um, and it changes these situations tend to have emergency workers or people who come in for six months maybe a year and then you need to kind of bring a new person up to speed uh, so we've seen success with the longer the organization is on the ground the better they're able to know who the contact person is and build those personal relationships with the people in leadership and other organizations including UNHCR and camp management so we've had some success with that as well because we've been able to be on the ground since um, the beginning of 2018 and we opened in 2018 and we've been able to see some success with that. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our speakers. We're going to have a chance now for your questions and comments. I uh, received one question in advance which we'll start with. But I'll just give you a moment just to formulate if you've got any questions that are sort of coming to you that you want to bubble up. Um, and what I would ask is just to keep them as brief as possible. We don't have time for people to share their views and thoughts, unfortunately, in this session. But just to reiterate, for those who went to the beginning, in the purple room straight after this session, there will be a facilitated space if you want to bring up some more 
reflections and comments. So if I could ask you to keep your comments nice and brief at this point. So the Manus, are you still there? <coughs> Hello? You're still here? Yeah. Okay, can you hear us okay? Okay, so. So one of the facilitators wrote down this question. I'm just struggling to read what the full words on it. Can you <laughs> write that down? Yeah. Was it your question? Are you happy to share it or would you like me to try? It was, it was just uh, how good are the INGOs about including the voices of refugees and migrants in their work? Right, thank you. Who would like to take that first? I, yeah, I can. <laughs> so within our organization, we work with children. However, we have been able to really see what the need was before we even opened our NGO. And then as we opened, we brought the students on board for a lot of different aspects down to like what kind of furnishings do you want within our youth center what kind of um, what name do you want for each class and then we also in our classes were able to have them vote their own class representatives so that each of the six classes has a girl and a boy who are voted by their peers to talk with us to tell us if they want different food if they want different activities different classes within our center and we also use community volunteers, which is what we would, that's the term we tend to use for um, refugees, adult refugees on the island who would like to participate in our center. They, um, they can become leaders within our center. So we have a few different community volunteers who volunteer to teach our students. Um, so they come from, they also are refugees on the island, but they're able to teach different classes within our center and help support the other students within the center. That's just my own organization, but I think every organization has different ways they interact with the people they serve. Thank you. I'd be interested to hear from um, from UNHCR what, what your perceptions have asked me of how how much agency people seeking sanctuary on the islands have in the, the ways in which the, the basic humanitarian needs and, and other longer term issues are, are listened to, what voice they have in those discussions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Of, for us, uh, we, we call it in UNHCR community-based protection and uh, because the, the, core, uh, uh, the core actor in this are the communities themselves. So we try always to implement our programs uh, with this approach and uh, we have different uh, methods for doing that and uh, for example we have uh, focus group discussions this is different groups of different age and uh, gender that we bring together so we can have discussions on uh, specific issues about the <coughs> needs and uh, solutions um, we have participatory assessments once a year uh, taking into consideration it's called age and gender uh, uh, mainstreaming and um, diversity mainstreaming and uh, we have it uh, uh, every year so we tried also to do it on the islands it's not over always easy and uh, that's what i wanted to say that the, under these conditions uh, that prevail in these uh, centers it is very difficult to implement uh, protection activities uh, in a holistic manner and uh, to be able to to mainstream an approach especially if there is no uh, enough cooperation by the authorities to do so because for us it's important in all our activities either if it's uh, meetings with community representatives uh, focus group discussions uh, um, different uh, projects uh, with uh, refugees uh, that they have the lead on this for us it's important that the authorities are part of it and it's not just UNHCR so on other islands the, in other rigs you have the authorities involved in some of the rigs, maybe some child protection focal points from the, on behalf of the authorities, they can be part of the discussions with unaccompanied children, for example, in order to hear their needs in clothes, in what they need um, while they are in the safe areas or outside. Oh, but on other, in other rigs, there is no involvement at all. And this is our main struggle, that we would like to build the capacity of the authorities to really also apply the community-based approach in their programs, because don't forget, it's some, this whole situation is something also new for Greece. Huh? So they, they will have to, uh, capacity building uh, uh, of authorities and services is important on such issues. Thank you, Rasmia. I just wanted to add one comment to that, which is, <coughs> I think, um, 
something that we see over and over that is really overlooked is uh, prioritizing the need for translators, for interpreters. And I think that has a huge impact on whose voice is heard, whether it's by NGOs, by the government, by um, the media, you know, by anyone. And so when you go into a context and you hear that, well, I haven't been able to talk to anyone because there's never an interpreter around, um, or, or there isn't a female interpreter, for example, um, it's really limiting whose voice is going to be heard. And I think that's an ongoing and continual problem. And again, not just in Greece. I saw the same thing in Italy and in other places. Um, but I think it's really important that that become much more of a priority. Because if we're going to listen to people on the ground who are experiencing this, they have to be able to communicate. Thank you. Can I open up to other questions then, please? What I might do is just take, we've got two, I'll take both questions and then I'll ask the panel to respond. So the lady at the back first. Okay, thanks. Um, sort of at Sarah, so I'll stand up so we can continue. I've uh, had this question for four years, what, especially when the first decisions were com started coming from the High Court about specific groups of refugees, why these don't result in a broader order of some sort that would affect all the accompanied minors, for example, if five accompanied, unaccompanied minors get this decision. And there have been other examples of decisions which I don't understand why they don't apply broadly. Obviously, I'm from the US, like you are. Yeah. It's just like, wait a minute, when the courts decide stuff. <laughs> yeah, Thank that's you. my question. Um, yeah, mine's probably slightly longer, so I'm sorry, I'll be brief as, brief I can as you can. Be. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is Sally Hyman. I run a charity housing pregnant women and women with new babies called Pips International. Um, my question is particularly for um, Hillary and for Erasmia. Um, we often receive requests for housing from women who've been forced to leave their babies in the hospital because they have nowhere to go, but women who've recently birthed, um, maybe four or five days before, are on the street. Why is there no embedded UNHCR, SDR program worker in maternity units? Why are families um, with, with tiny babies, single moms, finding themselves sleeping in parks, sleeping in crowd accommodation, um, and why is the, the breastfeeding relationship between the mother and baby broken in such early days? And this is a big issue. Babies die from being badly fed um, and bottle fed in Greece. This is, this is a matter of, of life and death, and it really disturbs me very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, are you happy to take the first question first? Um, I can say what I know, and then if, if other people know more, they can say more. Um, I am not a lawyer, and I don't immediately have a very good answer for you. I have the same question. The only thing that really comes to mind is that each asylum case is considered separately. No matter how much you might say, yeah, but this boy is also from the same country, of a similar age, every asylum case is considered separately. So that makes it very difficult to do something, I guess in the States we would say something like a class action where, yeah, once you have this many people with the same experience, you would think that you would be able to address but all of these unaccompanied minors. When the high yeah, court it's about that conditions. conditions are wrong for this five, why aren't the, condi the same conditions prevail for... Well, yeah. I mean, I can tell you a little bit about more about like how we submitted it. It did involve them meeting with lawyers and each individual person telling the story of their conditions, giving their testimony, and then um, I believe three out of our five also provided um, a psychological evaluation through um, uh, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. Mm -hmm. um, so they had like, they made an entire case for each individual. They submitted it together as five. Um, but I don't know from a legal perspective why that can't mm -hmm. affect the greater group. The only thing that I think is that it's because each case is usually considered separately. Do you have? Yeah, essentially it's, I mean, yes, it, it doesn't seem to make sense, right, on the face of it, but essentially it's because the court decision is saying that the conditions for these five individuals are unacceptable, and 
I mean, you would hope that then that would be interpreted more broadly to say, okay, clearly we need to do something for the conditions for everyone, but the court decision is not mandating that no. and can't because, yes, you would have to have each individual and the conditions that they are living in or the circumstances that they are um, existing in be evaluated, um, you know, unfortunately. I mean, the idea would be, though, that obviously this is the kind of decision that, you know, we as, a, as an organization point to repeatedly and say, you know, the European court has already ruled that this form of condition is unacceptable. So it is something that can still be leveraged to try to put pressure um, to create, you know, to improve the situation for everyone. But unfortunately, the individual decision technically doesn't apply to each individual case. Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay, just wait one second. Decision on asylum is uh, personalized, so it is it is for each and every individual who is above the age of fourteen, because below the age of fourteen you cannot apply. So let's talk about the family. Then you have a family of four. You have one father, one mother, a child that is sixteen years of age, and a child that is twelve years of age. Yes. How many applications you have? Three. How many decisions? Three. Let's take this thing that the father of the family is prioritized and he gets a decision and the decision is negative. Are we going to return the father and keep the uh, family here? No, is the answer. If the father gets a positive decision, is he going to get out of the camp and the mother is going to stay in the camp? No, is the answer. What does the Greek law say? The Greek law says that you cannot separate the family. So if the father gets a positive decision, the mother and the children can get a residence permit in Greece for the same time as the father. Because we all have to consider and take into it's a serious consideration that asylum is actually a residence permit for three years with protection. So we try to find a solution to that. So we should prioritize at least the fathers of the families to get a decision faster. If he gets a positive decision, he can, according with the Greek law, pull the family with him. Of course, the application of the mother and the application of the child that is 16 years of age would be examined, in, will be examined in a second time, in a second instance, later on. But still, they will have a residence permit in the country and they will be off the reception system. This is, of course, UNHCR will never accept that, but we, there is a Greek law for that, so we have to follow the Greek law. So, and if we do so, I think that we are more fair. This is one thing. Of course, if the father gets a negative decision, we will examine immediately the mother's application. And if the mother gets a negative decision, we will examine the son's or the child's uh, application. If they all have a negative application, they are supposed to be Returnees. If one of them gets at any instance a positive, this positive decision should pull the rest with the member of the family. This is prioritization and this will eventually lead to a decongestion of the camps. So there are some things that have not been done in the past and should be done. There is some other questions there. Unaccompanied minors. If they do not get asylum, I don't know a reason why an unaccompanied minor will not get uh, asylum, but generally speaking, there is maybe asylum specialist knows 
uh, a reason uh, why he should not get asylum. Is he going to be returned? No, is the answer. So why we have to keep them in camps? The answer to that is simple because we still have 4,000 unaccompanied children in Greece and we only have the capacity in special, special shelters for 2,000. So we should focus on specific details that will make a huge, will make a huge impact on the whole situation if we all agree that this situation is not for all and not forever. Thank Why? You. Because if we let this family go out of the camp, they are not supposed to get any support other than what the Greeks are receiving. And this is a big trick. That's why I told you, Greece has decided that it is not an accommodation country forever. It should be a country where third country citizens apply for asylum, get asylum if they deserve it, and then they are given out to integration into the Greek society, but with the same benefits and the same obligations as the Greek citizens. This is a very big problem. Why it is a big problem? Because we are have made this, excuse me, just, just one minute. It is important for you to understand. We made these people think that we will be there for them forever. And this is not true. Cash assistance, everything, accommodation, is given only to asylum seekers. And that's the end. Thank you, Dr. Manos. I know we're short on time, but I do want to just ask Erasmia if, um, if she can respond to the, the question from Cribs International, I think is very important. And particularly, there was a question about why there were no embedded UNHCR workers in maternity units and the housing situation with regards to mothers with young babies. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I, I heard the, the question, all the question, or maybe parts of the question. I, I will give a, an answer that is more general. Okay, would you like, can you just come up quickly? And, can you come up to the computer quickly? Mike. Rosmia, um, the question yeah. is that we often have to refuse housing to up to 40 families a month who have a new baby. Often the mothers and babies are separated in the hospital because the hospital will not release a baby, um, but they will release the mother maybe three or four days after giving birth. Why does the UNHCR not connect directly with the hospitals in Athens? We work in Athens. Um, and ensure that the mother <coughs> and the whole family are housed within the SDR program. Why are we continuing to take families from Kipseli Park, from, from Victoria, and trying to provide them with housing? We're a tiny organization. You're huge. This is your responsibility. All right. Okay. I, I, I understand uh, very well, um, like, how you feel because this uh, situation with homeless uh, vulnerable persons is uh, is something that uh, everybody is uh, facing and uh, the authorities but also organizations that work uh, in this um, for responses and the management of this situation but i would like to say that when you say it is your responsibility let's clarify that uh, we are here to, to support the Greek authorities, as I said at the beginning of, uh, of uh, our discussion. And uh, we have done this exceptionally to assist uh, the Greek authorities after 2015-2016. Here we, and we continue to do that in coordination with the Greek authorities. As I said, the STEEL program, it started back then in the emergency, and it was a humanitarian program. But uh, since we are believing as unity are that always there must be a transition to the, to the states we are working with, now we are in the process to transit these uh, big programs, the STIA, which is accommodation and cast, to the Greek authorities. 
And uh, as also Mr. Lobothetti said before, the, the target uh, uh, before it was that the criteria was that these were open to everybody, but now, because it's in accordance with the reception directive, the European legislation, which is also uh, in the Greek legislation, now this is targeted assistance to asylum seekers. Uh, so, in terms of eligibility, this is uh, one, uh, one, one element as a response to you. The second is that the capacity is the same as it happens with the camps, with the rigs, with the apartments, with everything. The limitations in the accommodation capacity in Greece, they are real. Uh, I mean, you have seen over the years that there have been more places, more sites, more apartments, but it has it reaches also uh, up to a limit. It's related also to to funding and a lot of other things. But uh, at this point, the ST accommodation is about uh, as a 25.7 hundred places, and there are asylum seekers in the apartments who may stay there also for another six months um, as in their transition to recognize refugees. So. Uh, it does not mean that there is space in these apartments. There are entry criteria and exit criteria. So it doesn't mean that people who are there can exit so that other people can come in uh, at any time. And to answer your question, with all the respect and the understanding for what you're saying, because we all feel the same, uh, it doesn't mean that there is space in this estia which is transitioning now to the Ministry of uh, Migration and Asylum, that there is space for everybody, uh, who is for every refugee and for every vulnerable person. Imagine that in these apartments, only the most vulnerable asylum seekers uh, are hosted. And there are many more, but there is no uh, additional capacity. Rosalia, so, I'm very yeah. sorry to, to cut you off, but we've got a group of ah. people who are waiting very patiently outside this room to come in. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate, I appreciate your response.